All right, well, let's get started. Um, I want to say welcome to everyone to the last uh, seminar in this series for the semester. And I know that you may think that our own Professor Gerald Funewalt needs no introduction, but because Gerald is actually a very unassuming and quiet scholar and not a careerist or someone who actively draws attention to themselves, I'm actually really happy to have a chance to say a bit about why we in this department are so incredibly privileged to claim Gerald as a UJ colleague. I believe I've correct in uh, that Gerald is currently the only early modernist historian working at a South African university right now. And I think um, it's also fair to say that Gerald is one of our most productive researchers. He's the author of at least 20 publications, including the book Trials of Slavery, which draws upon the court records that he'll be speaking about today. Gerald is, not, is trained not only as a historian, but in the field of linguistics. And he does research in several languages and on topics not only about slavery in the Cape, but on Afrikaans as a language and on gender, family, and sexuality in the 17th and 18th centuries. Gerald's work is interesting because it's sensitive not only to Cape history in its African context, but also as part of the Indian Ocean world and as also as part of contemporary European cultural and social formations. So Gerald, it's, um, it's really wonderful to have you presenting today. And um, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and ask that you share your screen and get started. So thanks. Uh, thank you very much for that, Timbi. So let me just share my screen here. Okay. Share. Right, so if you cannot see this, uh, just let me know. Um, it's best if you unmute yourself because I cannot see the chat. It's when... fine. We can see. Thanks. So yeah, thank you very much for that, Timbisa. Um, it's a privilege to talk about a topic that's really close to my heart. Um, uh, and the reason I'm talking about this, let me just move to the next slide, which is not working. Here we go. So um, this talk is based on this book that I produced some years ago with Nigel Worden, who was formerly professor at UCT, he's retired now. Um, <clears throat> and the reason it's kind of on my mind is that we are currently busy with a project to digitize the contents of the book. The book is actually still in print, uh, remarkably. So if you want to buy a copy, let me know. Uh, it is a massive tome, let me show you. <laughs> I, it is 740 pages long. Uh, it contains 87 criminal cases from the Council of Justice at the Cape of Good Hope in the 18th century. Those 87 cases translate to about three to 400 individual documents because most cases have more than one document uh, about it. And each document is transcribed and then it has a translation as well as a bit of a commentary. Um, and so everything I want to talk about in this, this, in this talk today is in this book. So that's also why I give the references in a certain way. It's an easy way to find uh, uh, what I'm talking about in the book. Um, just two things before I start. Uh, you will see that I refer to slaves in an unusual way. They always have the word fun in the middle. Um, and I am doing this deliberately uh, this is called a toponym. So slaves at the Cape didn't have surnames, they have toponyms. A toponym is then denoting where somebody came from. Uh, and you have the same thing in many uh, European language surnames, especially Afrikaans and Dutch surnames, which have the word fun or de in it. It means where somebody originated from. Uh, and also I will uh, always use the Dutch pronunciation of these slave names as a reminder that although I'm presenting this in English, although everything that I put on the screen is translated into English, this was a different world. Uh, this was a Dutch speaking world and it's useful to remember that. Um, I'm going to, if I can figure out how to do this, uh, 
switch off the video so you can see the screen properly. Okay, so I am going to follow a text very closely for the simple reason that I know from experience that if I just talk off the cuff, which I'm able to do, I tend on to go way too long. <laughs> so I need this discipline. Also, the first 10 minutes or so will be background to slavery at the Cape before we talk about some of the cases and the topic for today, which is how to use court cases, criminal court cases, to, uh, to, 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 to recapture or uh, reconstruct aspects of the slave experience. Um, okay. So by the time that the Dutch East India Company, uh, which is also called the VOC, it's Dutch abbreviation, or I simply call it the company, by the time that they established a service station at the Cape of Good Hope in 1652, slavery was already a well-established institution in its empire in the Indian Ocean. Van Ribiek, the first commander who had previously served in the East Indies, was therefore familiar with the use of slave labor. During the first few years of his tenure, he often requested the company to send some slaves to the Cape. He even for a while considered capturing the indigenous Khoikhoi people for using as slaves, but his superiors forbade this. The first major imports of slaves to the Cape happened in 1658 as the result of the establishment of Freeburger farmers the previous year. These slaves came in two groups from the Homi, a country today in West Africa, and Angola in Central Africa. Thus, the very first slaves in South Africa came from Western Central Africa, but this Atlantic origin of slaves was an exception in the history of Cape slavery, and all slaves subsequently came from the Indian Ocean world. In the century and a half after this, slaves were brought to the Cape in three ways. Firstly, there were company-sponsored voyages which brought slaves from Madagascar for most of the 17th and first half of the 18th century. And in the last decades of the 18th century, they started bringing them from Mozambique. Secondly, there were return fleets. These are a whole bunch of ships coming from the East Indies on their way to Europe. Um, they would often uh, bring a few individual slaves to the Cape, uh, which was who were sold there because slaves could not be taken to the Netherlands. So uh, these people who served in the East, these colonists, uh, would bring their slaves on the ship, but as all slaves stop at the Cape, they then sell them off before they continue their journey to Europe. And thirdly, this is uh, um, more in the second half of the 18th century, you also have foreign slave ships who stopped at the Cape on their way to the Americas from the slave markets in East Africa, um, particularly slaves that were on their way to Brazil. Brazil had an intense need for vast numbers of slaves. And in the second half of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th, they shifted to East Africa as opposed to Angola. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna talk about the origins of Cape slaves, but just to orient you. So I hope you can see my cursor. Here is the Cape, uh, here is Mozambique, which you should know. Here is the island of Madagascar. Um, I'm also gonna talk about the Indian subcontinent. Remember today, India is actually three different countries, but in this period, it's one huge country. Um, and also Sri Lanka today, which in this period was called Ceylon. And then here is Indonesia, which the Dutch called the Dutch East Indies. And that's where they had, the VOC had its headquarters here on the island of Java. The VOC also had some uh, trading posts here in Southeast Asia. So where did these slaves came from? Over the 140 year period of Dutch rule, the origins of Cape slaves changed continually taking globally, in other words, all the slaves who were imported to the Cape over this period counted together, slaves came in more or less equal numbers from Madagascar, uh, the Indian subcontinent, the Indonesian islands, and Mozambique. However, and this is an important point to remember, different regions were preponderant at different times. For example, during the late 17th century and the early decades of the 18th century, most Cape slaves originated from Madagascar and India, while those from Indonesia increased from the 1720s to the 1760s. 
Mozambique only became a major source of slaves for the Cape from the 1770s onwards. Most slaves arrived at the Cape as individuals or in very small groups. This had two consequences. Firstly, the numbers of slaves grew very slowly over the course of this 150 year period. And secondly, given the diverse origins of the Cape slaves and because they mostly arrived as individuals, there was little opportunity for a unified slave culture or feelings of solidarity to develop. The slave population grew slowly, but from the first decade of the 18th century onwards, the numbers of slaves at the Cape slightly outnumbered that of the European colonists at the Cape, but never by much. It's normally like five or so percent more than the colonists. Thus, by the end of the VOC rule at the Cape in 1795, there were just under 17,000 slaves in the colony in comparison with about 15,500 freeburgers. Um, it has been calculated chiefly by Robert Schell uh, that between 1652 and 1808, when you have the end of the slave trade, um, a total of about 63,000 slaves were imported to the Cape. The slave population at the Cape was divided between two groups, those belonging to the company and those in private ownership. These groups differed in significant respects. Slaves belonging to the VOC, who were normally called company slaves, um, given the fact that they generally came in groups, in larger groups, like 30, 40, 50 at a time, and tended mostly to originate for the first 100 or so years from Madagascar, and then later on Mozambique, they formed a much more homogeneous group. This was also by, aided by the fact that the majority of them lived together in the slave lodge in Cape Town. The numbers there fluctuated, but mostly there were between 450 and 600 slaves living in the building at any given time during the 18th century. And most of you, if you've ever been to Cape Town, will have seen this building. Here it is on the right. This is how it looks today. Uh, down there is Adley Street, up here is Val, Val Street, um, it's on the corner there. And you can just about see here on this side, uh, the wall of the so-called Kerk, the, 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 the big NGK church in Cape Town, which was built at around the same time as the Slave Lodge. Um, this facade, this entrance is a 19th century construction. In the 19th century, this building uh, served, would believe it or not, as the Supreme Court of the Cape Colony. Um, in the 17th and 18th century, the building was started to be constructed in the 1670s. The building looked like this here on the, on the left. Um, and here, this is where Adley Street would be today. The entrance was on the side, right opposite the church, which you can see here on the left. And you can see all these trees and, and, and lands here. Uh, of course, here, and today still it is there, but it's much smaller than it was in that period, is the company gardens. And the company gardens was, of course, a working garden. And most of these slaves would be working in this garden, uh, producing fruit and vegetables and things like that. So at first, company slaves far outnumbered those owned by private individuals, but this soon changed when the number of private slaves grew rapidly. So much so that by the end of the VOC period in 1795, only 3% of all Cape slaves belonged to the company. The rest were in private hands. Because of the way in which private slaves landed at the Cape, normally in small numbers at a time, often some, even like one or two individuals at a time, it meant that their makeup was much more heterogeneous than that of the VOC slaves. A further division among private slaves was that between urban and rural slaves. Slaves who worked in urban households generally had greater freedom of movement and above all had more opportunity to meet and interact with other slaves. And this is, you see this clearly in court records, this difference. It was therefore possible for them to keep up ties and to develop friendships with people who share the same origins and the same languages. Slaves on farms, on the other hand, were generally much more isolated from other slaves and they had fewer opportunities to interact with people of the same background. While in general, they also had much more contact with koi koi laborers on the farm. Private ownership was not evenly spread throughout the colony. I should just add here that uh, by the end of the 18th century, the, the Cape Colony 
uh, was settled more or less today's Western Cape province, uh, the Western part of the Northern Cape province and the Western part of the Eastern Cape province. So it was pretty large by the end of the 18th century. Um, so as I say, private ownership was not evenly spread throughout the colony. The greatest concentration of private slaves were found in Cape Town itself and its immediate hinterland. Then in the agrarian parts of the Southwestern Cape, uh, that's where grain and wine were produced, while on the pastoral frontiers to the east and the north, um, there were only a very few slaves, since these farmers relied much more on koi koi labor. It is important to keep that individual slaves' holdings remained very small. This is a significant difference between Cape slavery and Atlantic slavery. Only the very wealthiest farmers, and there would never be more than a handful of them, uh, would own more than 20 slaves, and they would even then be spread over several properties. While the majority of, of, of farmers had less or fewer than 10 slaves, and some as few as one or two. In general, wheat and, white, wheat and wine farmers owned the most slaves. Because of this fact, coupled with the diverse areas of origins that I mentioned of imported slaves and the variety of languages and cultures that they had, because of this, a single distinctive slave culture of the kind that we associate with some transatlantic, transatlantic slave societies did not emerge at the Cape. The Cape economy depended on slave labor. This was a slave society in the true sense of the word. In 1717, the Council of Policy who ruled the Cape debated whether or not slave labor or the use of European servants should become the norm at the Cape. The council decided in favor of slave, of slave labor, which resulted in an increase in the number of slaves from about 1720 onwards. The life of a slave was dominated by work. As the Stellenbosch slave who is only known as Jan said in 1710 after he unsuccessfully tried to kill himself, and he said, I quote, I wish to die or to be sold because I cannot keep up with working. Slaves on farms performed a variety of tasks throughout the year. Farm work was highly seasonal, but farms producing both grain and wine required steady work throughout the year. Circumstances in Cape Town were very different. There were variations between slaves who worked as domestic servants and those who were rented out as well as some specialized and skilled slaves. Some slaves had to sell provisions for the profit of their masters. A lot of uh, colonists who lived in Cape Town would own gardens where they produce food and vegetables. Uh, the neighborhood or the suburb now called gardens in Cape Town is where these gardens were. And this, their slaves would then sell this, these produce on the streets and markets of Cape Town. And the money that they earned would be known as kuligeld. Um, so there were also slaves with skills such as artisans, masons, carpenters, and so on, who were rented out to other people and the money would go to the owner. In general, slaves in the town had greater freedom of movement, were less rigidly controlled, and had much more opportunity to interact with other slaves and even to make some money for themselves in some, uh, some cases. Now, thus far, I have talked about slavery at the Cape from the outside, a generalized picture that has been developed by historians using a variety of sources and trying to make sense of the institution of slavery. However, it is possible for us today to learn something of the lives of slaves from the inside, to look at slaves as agents who, insofar as the limits of their situation allowed for it, could make their own lives. In other words, they were not merely objects who were acted upon. And this was the main uh, aim behind this book that Nigel and I produced, is to make this kind of thing possible. Now, the Cape historian is both fortunate and unfortunate regarding the sources for the Dutch period. The VOC as a merchant company kept records obsessively and these have been well preserved, remarkably well in the Cape. However, unlike most colonial societies, we lack so-called ego documents, such as diaries, letters, and other documents written by people in their private capacity. 
because slavery ended so early in South Africa in 1834, um, uh, just for comparison, it ended in 1865 in the United States and in the 1880s in parts of Latin America. Um, because it ended so relatively early, we do not have the memories of former slaves documented by oral historians in the early 20th century, as is the case elsewhere, particularly in the Americas. Instead, we are informed in detail by the VOC archive about the business and legal affairs of those at the Cape, chiefly the company itself and then the colonists who lived there. While this is the case for Freeburgers, the situation is much worse regarding slaves. Slaves were generally illiterate, there are some exceptions, and we lack documents written by them, with some noteworthy exceptions that I'll show you in a moment. We discovered two such documents while working on trials. The first is a letter presented by the slave Jonas van Manado. Uh, Manado is a town on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia. I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, and he wrote a letter, Jonas, to his mistress, he's the, the wife of his owner, in 1719, in which he requested her to manumit him, to free, her, to free him saying that his owner had promised to do so before his death. The owner had died shortly before. Clearly, Jonas thought some form of written document would aid or assist his cause. The language in which it is written reveals much about how he thought his owner would perceive his status. And here you see this, uh, this very interesting document. I will read an English translation as it is in Trials of Slavery to you. Um, your honorable mistress's obedient slave gives notice with all humility and sadness of heart with the presentation to you of how he, the suppliant, has served you since fully 10 years ago now with faithful service without complaining to anybody. Consequently, he is finally asking you with hands clasped and knees bent praying humbly that it would please you to look upon him in keeping with your innate mercifulness, with the eyes of compassion, and to please permit him a letter of freedom. He promises to serve you with faithful service. This is a very rare case of us actually hearing directly the voice of a slave, albeit via the conventions of the time, dressed up in a style and language that he thought would appeal to his owner. We do not know who wrote the actual letter, and the document in the Cape Archives is clearly a copy, as is attested by the lack of signature and the final sentence. If you can see my cursor here at the bottom, there's a stock phrase that clerks would write to show that something is a copy of an original document. But this is all that survives in the court documents. By the way, he was not manumitted. Uh, Another new discovery, and that was very exciting, I well remember the day I found this, was a document written in the Boogie's script dating from 1786. You see the name here on the top Boogie's. I will show you in, in a moment where, where they came from. Boogie's is the name of a group, an ethnic group on the island of Sulawesi in the eastern part of Indonesia, and they have their own language called Boogie's or Boogie's, um, and they during this period had also their own unique script. It's, it reads from right to left, like Arabic and Hebrew. Um, and um, uh, by the way, the word, the term boogeyman, which the older people among you will know, comes from the boogies, but that's another story. Okay, so this document was obtained by Augustus von der Karp, um, which means he was born in, Cape, in the Cape, uh, unlike most slaves, and his band of fellow deserters who decided to flee to the interior from Cape Town with the aim of reaching what they called the land of the Corsa. They obtained this document that you see here from a Muslim cleric, and it seems to have served as a sort of talisman to protect them against possible dangers en route and from being captured. So it was a form of magic that they had here. Although it is written, and this is very intriguing, it's written in the Boogie script, um, the bulk of the document is actually in Arabic, but written in the Boogie script. So you can write Arabic in Arabic letters, but you can also transcribe it into Roman alphabet, like we write, uh, but it would still be Arabic. And it contains mostly the names of Muslim prophets 
and holy people. So clearly uh, it served as a form of magic, as a form of protection, and it's most likely that some of these slaves who fled with Augustus, Augustus I should say, um, were probably um, uh, Muslim. In fact, uh, and this is why it was so exciting to discover this document, it was the second Bugis letter that we know of. This letter from 1760 is in both the Bugis script and in the Bugis language. Um, and it played an important role uh, in the case of Achilles van der Vescus and his fellow deserters in 1760s. That is an amazing case. Um, it should really be made into a, a film, um, the so-called Smuts Murders. Um, but this, this document has been known since about the late 1920s when the linguist J.L.M. Franken discovered it um, and translated it. But to come back to the previous document, um, uh, which played a role in the case of Augustus van der Kaap, um, there was another intriguing discovery in this case, which I show you here. So in the same case also illustrates just how important written documents was in the early Cape. The same gang of deserters, uh, Augustus van der Kaap and his fellow deserters, there were about 10 of them, um, they realized that they needed some kind of justification for their journeying through the interior. Slaves couldn't just walk around the way that they pleased. And for, for this reason, they bribed a 12-year-old schoolboy to forge them a pass, what they call at the time a pat uh, It literally means a little letter for the road or the, or the way. Um, and really, this is an early form of a pass. So if you thought that pass... Uh, the past laws were invented by the apartheid regime, you were wrong, they've been in existence for a long time. Um, and this, this document claims that the band was sent out on formal business by a butcher to collect cattle and sheep from them. Uh, it says literally, allow these uh, boys named so and so and so to pass to collect um, sheep and cattle uh, from un all the way up to the, the Great Fish River. Just a second. I wish I could have shown you more such documents, but this is about the sum total of documents directly emanating from slaves. There are about five of them in total. For our knowledge about the lives of Cape slaves, we are dependent on the official VOC records. An important source which has been much utilized by Cape historians over the past few decades, including myself, is the vast archive of the Council of Justice at the Cape, which has been preserved almost in its entirety. This is a large archive. <laughs> um, people, I, I've been uh, telling my students, this, my honor students this past semester, just non-historians don't realize how much of the past remains in the form of written documents. The Cape was, compared to the rest of the world, a very tiny little place, but it left behind an enormous amount of paper. Um, the archi this archive, the Council of Justice archive, comprises some 250 meters of shelf space. So if you put each page next to each other, um, it will go to 250 meters, which is a long time. A long way, and it contains just fewer than 3,700 volumes, ranging from 100 to well over a thousand pages each. So you know you can you can imagine how many words there are in there. This archive naturally contains all the documents relating to judicial activities, including notarial notarial deeds and wills. But it is the 600 or so volumes of criminal court cases which are so useful to the slave historian. They are also, by the way, um, civil court cases. Uh, these records contain the minutes of court proceedings, the formal sentences, as well as the depositions, the statements, the confessions, the interrogations, all of them that served in the individual uh, cases. Now here is a treat for you, sorry, um, a rare look into the bottom most um, vault of the Cape Archives in Ruland Street in Cape Town. So here on the right hand side, you see the CJ Archive, the Council of Justice Archives. And you can see how fat some of these volumes are. And they go down all the way to the back. There are two rooms, 14 rows of shelves. Um, 
coincidentally, on the right hand side, you have the Council of Policy Records. Uh, you will notice that they are very beautifully bound. Herein lies an interesting story about the politics of archives. Um, but that aside, um, and these two, you can see how big they both are. They are just two sub archives of about 10 sub archives which constitute the VOC archives. It is vast. So the bulk of the accused in criminal cases were slaves. You may well ask why documents about the various crimes that slaves committed, such as desertion, theft, arson, assault, murder, and so on. Why could these be useful beyond the mere chronicling of those crimes? You know, why would other people who are not historians of crime want to look at this? Naturally, these cases are not representative of all slaves at the Cape, only those who somehow broke the law, and that would be a minority. That is certainly true on a superficial level and would be the case if we take these documents at face value and only look at the obvious facts regarding the crime committed. However, a major aim of Trials of Slavery was to demonstrate that these documents can be used much more broadly by someone who is prepared to read carefully and with some empathy. In between the gruesome details of crime and punishment is revealed a wealth of information regarding the living circumstances of slaves, the types of jobs that they performed, their interaction with others, and even smaller details like the sort of language that they spoke. We'll see examples of this soon. The type of bedding they had, the sort of clothes that they wore, and how they adorned themselves. Most of what we know about these matters have has been derived from the careful study of court records over the past uh, three to four decades. The issues that I just mentioned still consider the slave from the outside as an object. This is what they wore, this is what they ate, this is what they, their jobs were. It is possible in the court records to discern something of the slave as a thinking, feeling and acting individual, as someone who had motives and reasons and emotions and who acted on them. But before doing so, before looking at some examples of that, let's briefly discuss the problems inherent in using court records. It's important to remember that these documents originated under highly unusual circumstances. They deal with crimes or suspected crimes, not everyday events, and are thus not the equivalent of diaries or correspondence. In addition, the statements and depositions were given by accused people or witnesses who wanted to emphasize their innocence. And of course, the documents did not come into being through the volition of the slaves, through the will of the slaves, but rather through the legal apparatus of the VOC. The clerks and legal officers who drew up these documents were hardly neutral observers. And we should keep in mind just how intimidating the situation must have been for most slaves. You're faced here with a bunch of, of, of highly powerful people and you have to answer their questions. The actual nature of the documents are also such that they preclude direct access to what the slave said. Statements were usually given in Dutch, a foreign language for most slaves. Or if they were given in another language, it was directly interpreted with only the Dutch version being written up and thus ending up in the archives. Only in some cases are there interrogations which record more directly the answers of a slave. Ultimately, the court records are documents written about slaves for a very specific reason. In other words, trying to prove the guilt of some person who has been accused of a crime. And these documents should never be seen as documents produced by slaves. Yet they are still the only real source of access to the experiences of slaves. And although the original voice of the slave is muffled through the layers of transmission, the empathetic and patient reader can still discern something of that. So what can we learn about the inner life of slaves and its expression in the court records. Truth be told is that in the majority of cases, we cannot discern the motivation of slaves for their actions as recorded in the documents. For example, this is a very sad case. In 1786, the Londrost of Swellendam, which is in the Southern Cape, sent a letter to the Council of Justice in Cape Town, informing it 
of the suicide of a slave woman called Sara, who first threw her four children into a river and then hurled herself into it. All of them drowned except the oldest of the four children. This is the sum total of what we know about the life of a person called Sara, that she was a slave woman with four children who reached a point of such intense desperation that she had to end all of their lives. In this case, the voice of Sara remains forever silent. Just how different the aims of the Council of Justice were from the interest of the modern historian is revealed by the remarkable case of Rainier van Madagascar, who came from Madagascar. We meet Rainier in 1729 when he was about 40 years old and well respected by his fellow slaves. They actually told him that he had helped building up the farm through his hard work over the past 20 or 30 years. However, his fellow slaves taunted him because he, Rainier, did not complain about the fact that his mistress, the wife of his owner, daily maltreated his daughter, called Sabina, who worked in the house. One day, after particularly bad behavior by his owners towards Sabina, Rainier cracked and, quote, out of desperation and grief, as he said in his trial, he stabbed his owner with a knife. He then fled to the mountains around Franche Hoop, where he remained for some 20 years, claiming never to have spoken to a single person during all that time, until he was finally captured. Now the members of the Council of Justice were only interested in the detail of the crime, and thus we cannot know what it must have been like for Rainier to have lived alone in the mountains for two decades, what thoughts went through his mind, and if he missed his wife and daughter. Here we see both the wonder and the drawback of using the Council of Justice documents. They allow us an intensely vivid glimpse of complex lives, like lightning which momentarily lit up a landscape very clearly, only to disappear back into the darkness just when we want to look closer. One set of cases which do as a rule provide us more detail about and greater insight into the lived reality, the emotional lives and motives of slaves deal with so-called crimes of passion. Crimes of passion normally involved a jilted male lover who took revenge on his former lover or her new lover. Gender-based violence is also not something that's new. These cases are often very violent, born out of an intense feeling of unhappiness and frustration. This is a consequence of the deleterious effect the institution of slavery had on interpersonal relationships. Slaves could not legally get married before 1823 at the Cape, and since they are the possessions of their owner, those in informal relationships and their children, if they had any, could easily be separated through sale. Yet this situation did not stop slaves from falling in love with each other and from starting long-term monogamous relationships, often with children. Like everyone else, slaves also had emotional lives. In fact, it strikes me as highly plausible that their emotional lives could have been even more intense due to the very insecurity which ruled the life of a slave. In a situation where you have no control over your fate, time and work, having a loving relationship with another human being must have been like an oasis in a desert. The intense feelings and jealousy which are revealed in these cases were aggravated by the fact that slave women formed only a small percentage of the slave population. Only about 20 to 30 percent at most of slaves were female, with the result that they were the that there was much competition for their attention among male slaves, which no doubt increased the anxiety of their lovers. Uh, here is a, a, a close-up map of modern-day Indonesia. You can see it consists of four huge islands, the Borneo, Sumatra, Java down here, or Java as some people say, and Sulawesi. I have mentioned this island a few times right there on the top. Sulawesi has a very weird shape. It looks like a hand going into the sea. Right there at the top is Manadu. We earlier talked about Jonas von Manadu. Um, 
And the boogie people, the boogies, they live in the southern half of the island of um, uh, Sumatra. Um, what am I saying? Uh, sorry, Sulawesi. Uh, and uh, right here at the bottom, you have the biggest city in Sulawesi, which is called Makassar. Uh, anybody in South Africa will know the name Makassar, but that's where the South African place is called Makassar, uh, where that's where the name comes from. And um, on this island, there are three ethnic groups. One is the Bugis, the other are the Makassaris. Um, and we will deal with um, a case uh, involving such people. Just by the way, here on, on Java, um, is the city Jakarta or Jakarta, which is the capital of modern Indonesia. Um, this was the city of Batavia or Batavia, the capital of the VOC empire. It was founded in 1619. Um, and so we'll also deal with a slave who came from here, from Batavia. So in 1755, um, they lived in a home in Cape Town, a number of slaves whose owner had just died in the smallpox epidemic that had just ravaged the city, looking after the children and possessions of their late owners. Janiari van Buchis, so he comes from Sulawesi, and Clara van Makassar, who also comes from there, had been in a relationship for a number of years and had several children together. When Yaniari entered the house one afternoon, he found Clara and the cook together, whereupon he, as Yaniari later testified, quote, driven by the jealousy of love, asked the said Clara what this slave, the cook, against whom he had for a considerable time had conceived a certain jealousy, had to do with her, to which she answered, nothing at all. Yaniari went away grumbling, saying as he left, according to Clara, you have a soul and I have a soul. According to Yaniari, he was provoked. He was so provoked that he went outside to get a piece of wood. However, he became in his own words senseless and mindless because of anger. And instead he fetched his barang, which is a type of Indonesian sword, in order to take revenge upon Clara and her putative lover. Clara and the cook managed to escape, though not without being wounded. Yaniari fled to Table Mountain, but was soon apprehended. This incident of jealousy and an intense sense of insecurity going wrong led to Yaniari being hanged for the murderous wounding of Clara. Of significance here is Yaniari's statement about his and Clara's souls, one of only two tantalizing references in the records to slave conceptions of their souls. I have another example of this, but I decided to skip it because I didn't realize it is quite so late. Um, so just a small bit about uh, crimes of passion in general. Uh, these cases of crimes of passions are not extremely common. And of course, by no means should they be seen as normative. Only a very small number of slaves attacked and assaulted their spurned lovers. But they are immensely valuable to the historian since they allow us vivid and direct insight into the lived reality of slaves, to the dreadful circumstances of their situation, to their intensely felt emotions, which usually get expressed in their own words in the records, and to their motives for the actions that they performed. They allow us to see slaves as human beings with a full range of emotions and desires, who took charge of their own destiny and tried usually and unfortunately with dreadful consequences, to change it. Although they are exceptional cases, they are immensely insightful and revealing of the desperate situation in which some human beings found themselves at the Cape some two to three hundred years ago. Um, here is the castle um, of Good Hope, which was its name. It still, of course, stands there in the center of Cape Town. Um, and right opposite it, you see here in the middle, is the execution grounds. Um, this is where slaves or anybody who committed the crime were punished. Um, and normally the Council of Justice would stand there on this bastion and they would look at uh, justice being performed. Um, and, and this last bit that I want to talk about, um, this case ended right here on the execution ground um, with some horrible consequences. This is the last slide. I'll conclude with a final case which, although not a crime of passion, most loudly gives a voice to the inhumane nature of slavery at the Cape, and it well illustrates just how hard 
it must have been for a formerly free human being to adjust to the life of being a slave. Of all the slave cases I know, this one about the emotional crisis that Cupido van Malabar suffered in 1739 best expresses the iniquities of a slave situation in his own words. Uh, Malabar is the south west coast of India. Um, and on a personal note, since we also share our personal stories here, when we were working on trials of slavery, as I mentioned, there are 87 cases in this book, I left this case for the last because I, I really it really gets to me. You'll see why. Cupidu had come from India in his mid-20s and had ended up on a farm in Drakenstein. One night when his owner was away and he was home alone with his mistress, the wife of his owner, called Maria Klaas and her child, he went into a room and returned with a musket, a type of rifle. Upon asking him what he wanted to do with it, he answered Maria, quote, I do not want to shoot you, but myself. She begged him to put it down, which he did, but he ordered her to go with her child to the front of the house. When they got there, he took his knife and he held it against his own throat, asking Maria if she wanted to see him slit his own throat. She earnestly inquired why he wanted to do this and what was wrong with him, to which Capito simply replied, so much. After saying this, he removed his jacket and shirt and, pointing to his leather trousers, said to Maria, quote, I am not used to wearing trousers like these. I have already worked two or three years here, and I do not see the boss buying more slaves or Nonya buying a slave woman for me. Boss and Nonya may talk and laugh very well. In this sentence, Cupido encapsulated everything that was unbearable about his situation. The forceful removal from his own culture and the difficulties of adapting to a new culture and situation. The hard work he had to do on his own, the lack of company and a meaningful relationship, as well as the scorn of his owners. The events of the night when Cupido finally cracked continued with him vacillating between killing himself and killing his mistress. At a certain point, he told Maria, it would be better if I murder you, your husband and your child, and that I flay you open like flecked fish and then do me as well. Luckily, Maria managed to defuse the situation and she could, and she could flee and get help. Capito twice tried to commit suicide before finally being captured. Now, a slave wounding and threatening to kill his owner was considered an atrocity by the Council of Justice, who granted Capito his death wish by sentencing him, quote, to be broken alive from the bottom up with all the coup de grace to remain lying thus on the cross until he has given up the ghost. One can say much about how revealing this case is, but I think the message of the horrors of slavery at the Cape are sufficiently well expressed by the actions and the words of the unfortunate Capito himself. Thank you, I'll end there and I'll just show you, this is where poor Capito ended up and he would have been broken here on uh, the wheel. Uh, this sentence, it has a particular word, a verb for it in, in Dutch, rat braken, means that every bone in your body gets broken from, from your feet upwards. And uh, you will see in the sentence, it says, oh, I didn't put it down there, it says without the coup de grace, which means that you will endure this while being alive. Sometimes they would sentence people with the coup de grace, which means that shortly before they start this horrendous torturing of your body, they will kill you. They will normally um, suffocate you. Uh, sometimes you also have this in arson cases uh, where people get burned alive. They would first kill them. So yeah, thank you and I welcome questions and I apologize for taking up longer than I thought it would. Thanks, Gerald. I don't know if you wanna turn on your uh, video again. Um, I think you've left us with a, a very um, extreme um, example of, of some of the emotion you must also feel when you 
approach this subject and these documents and these voices. And um, I, I guess I'll look for hands, but I wonder if you would like to start out by just saying something about, about that, and then I'll ask Karen to say something as well. Um, yes, Demisa, this is actually very true. Uh, I, this was a, a very intense journey uh, working on this book. And in a time since then, I've actually systematically worked through all the, the criminal cases which have sentences remaining. Um, and it is, it is very tough. You, you can get extremely depressed. You know, when doing the book, it was doubly so because you worked so intensely with the documents. You, uh, you know, you first transcribe it in the archive, then you edit the original text, then you translate it, then you comment. So you work with it very intensely. Um, and, it, and it does take its toll. And in my career subsequently, you know, I, I've been working on crime and punishment for the past uh, several years. More recently, I've worked on, 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 on sexual assault and gender-based violence. Um, uh, it, is, it is very taxing. And um, uh, the way that I deal with it is not just to do that. As you know, I also work on things like language and, and book history and stuff like that. So sometimes I, I need to have a break and do something completely different uh, because it is. But I, I also feel that somebody needs to do this because as you rightly mentioned, there are only a handful of early modernist uh, people working on this period. And... Um, you know, if I don't do it, who else will do it? <laughs> and I kind of feel a responsibility um, that uh, it, this stuff should be known. Yeah, I think, um, you know, addressing the violence of the past, uh, it's, it's so common to talk about trigger warnings and all of that. And in some ways, history, when you really uh, engage in a, in a, in a field um, like this and in these kinds of worlds, it's, it's one big trigger warning. Um, I've got Karen, I've got Carissa, and then I have Nikki Ways, who are in line to ask questions. So Karen, you can unmute yourself. Uh, Karen, you must... Uh, good morning. Oh, so it's still morning here where I am. Um, Thank you very much, Gerald. That was very interesting. And I have many questions, but I will limit myself. Hmm? Sorry. It... Go ahead. There must be an echo on your side, but there's not from our side. I think there's also a lag in time, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, okay, I'll try again. Is this all right? Yes. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I'm on my my phone because my laptop died. Karen, go ahead with your question. I suspect there's a time lag between her and that's why she's not responding. Um, okay. Maybe we should. Maybe we can do Carissa and then Karen can come back or put okay. it in the, the chat. Karen, why don't you put your question in the chat and Carissa, if you'd like to go next. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Uh, um, I wanted to ask. Um, because it pertains to my research with focusing in on children uh, as another group who have been written about and there's not many records from them themselves. Um, considering the choice to gather evidence from the kind of a criminal institution, which by virtue of being a prison and viewing enslaved people as criminals or threatening or uh, violent or let's just say in a negative light, um, what checks and balances do you apply to counter that narrative and not carry those same views into your writing? Oh, thank you for that question, Chris. It's, um, many of my honor students, I think, are on this call and <laughs> they can answer this very well. And this is, I think, simply to, to be aware of how your sources came into being. 
Um, so if you know, uh, for instance, in your case about ch children, the history of childhood, if you know something has been written by a commission of investigation or by a prison authority, you need to be aware of what the bias and the assumptions those people would have would bring to the way that the document is produced. Um, uh, and so this is why contextual knowledge is so incredibly important. So I said several times in my presentation not to take things at face value. You cannot really use these documents unless, uh, in my specific case, unless you have a really good understanding of the way in which the court, the legal system operated at the time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, you have interrogations, which would have a list of questions on the one hand and then the answers on the left hand side, but you can see so clearly once you know how this works that this, this was not something that happened in real time. The questions were written beforehand um, and then they were put to the slave and they, <laughs> the, the questions had a, had a certain kind of logical flow in the mind of the prosecutor. Uh, he makes some, and then there's this kind of disjuncture between what the slave is saying or the person being interrogated is saying and what the, and what the prosecutor was assuming. This is an example from my work, but you can have this with any type of primary source. You need to know under what circumstances was it created, who was it created, for which audience, and then you need to know uh, the context very well, because that will make it clear to you uh, why it is presented in a certain way. So this is what we mean when we say about reading between the lines, reading against the, grains, uh, the grain, uh, looking um, looking for gaps and silences and assumptions which are there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Carissa. Thanks, Gerald. Um, how about uh, Nikiwe can go next? Nikiwe, if you want to unmute and put on your video, if you like. Um, thank you, Prof. Temisa. Thank you, Prof. Gerald. Um, I kept losing my network, so some of the questions I had, I have addressed them, but I kept uh, disconnecting and connecting back. But you mentioned a lot of concepts that I'm interested in, you know, um, reading ag against the grains and um, giving agency. So um, I'm interested in giving agency to um, to not just give agents right, but also to recognize that there are more parties that play a role in the process of history than just um, than just as humans. But also, you you give an interesting talk about slaves. So when we think of slaves, we we often just think of them as victims, victims, victims. But you mentioned that they had agency, and they may have or may have not. Uh, used it at their advantage. Not everybody had the same level of agency, right? So I want to know that from you as a lecturer at a university in a history department, what is um, the future looking like for us young aspiring historians, right? So we have all these complicated questions that we need to ask and we are trying to give agency and voices to the previously silenced and disadvantaged, right? uh, disadvantaged. But you also mentioned that these were the peoples who did not have uh, the literacy to keep journals, to keep diaries. So we see their voices emerging in, um, in court documents or generally governmental um, documents where there are deliberate and obvious biases. Then our responsibility as people who are trying to retell such histories is that we need to look for silences and we need to read against the grains. But how do we do this as young aspiring historians how do we how do we ask different questions using these documents? How do we read against mm. the grains? Do you think that at adversity level, at school level, we we are afforded the opportunity and the skills enough to go into the world and practice as historians, especially yeah. now as we are moving into uh, an era where technology is really going to take over? How do we still become? relevant 
I, I hope this makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question, Kiwi, but I'll try. Thank you very much. Yes, you're right. So a, d, 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 I would say the most important thing is not to make assumptions and not to look at things as a kind of monolithic block, you know, like you have this block of people and they're all the same and they're all suffering the same. This is why I started this talk with very carefully, carefully differentiating between different types of slaves at the Cape. So you can talk about Cape slaves and say they all suffer. Yes, that's true, but you know, you're not saying anything about them as individuals. But once you start thinking about where is this person placed, and the direct immediate context and put that person in a context. So here you have a woman slave who's working in a household. How many people are in the household? Um, uh, where did she come from? What was the age that she became a slave? All of these things will influence how you can uh, try and get into her, imagine her life. So this is why I always say to my student, the incredible importance of both empathy, which we all have now, and also imagination. You need to be able, in addition to knowing the, the past very, very well, as well as you can possibly do, um, know the context, the bigger picture in which what you're studying is happening, but you also need to have uh, imaginative sympathy. You also need to be able to put yourself in a, somebody's shoes, as it were. And then you start thinking about these things that I mentioned, you know, how, what is the difference between a, a person, a slave in the city, as opposed to slave on a farm? I didn't give, well, Monty Rainier is an example of that. So you can be on a farm and you have to keep in mind, this is the 18th century. There's no easy way of getting anywhere except through walking, or if you're lucky, if you have a horse, it takes a few hours to go to the next farm. And so you have these small microcosms. Um, so about, you know, your question about the future, firstly, yes, people, this is the reason why this year I started to, to focus much more in my honors teaching on, on um, what is it called, a source criticism, um, because I think people make too many assumptions about it. They just think if you know a little bit about source criticism, you can do all of them. But there are so many different categories. Uh, and you really need to think about the questions that you can ask of each type, different type of primary source. Um, but to the future, uh, how do you know what to ask? You first need to master the historiography. Uh, historians need to read vast amounts. This is what makes us different from most other disciplines. We need to master vast amounts in our own discipline and we have to read comparatively. This is how you get new ideas. So if I, who work on the Cape, on Cape Slavery, this is a small field. They have only really been 10 to 20 serious historians working on this over the past 50 years. But how do we get asked new questions? The, the, the archival material is there. You saw how big the archive is. Um, that remains there, that doesn't change. Maybe occasionally you're lucky and you come across something that nobody else has come across before, or they may have crossed, came across it, but they didn't realize it's significant. Um, as some of the things that we've seen, that we've discovered, you know, that stays the same. But what you can do by reading comparatively, by reading other slave societies, uh, not just the Atlantic world, because as I said, the Atlantic world is very unusual, uh, different from the Cape. The Cape is, is a very different type of slave society from the Atlantic world. But that scholarship is immensely nuanced and well-developed. Read that. Also read um, the Indian Ocean, uh, about Indian Ocean slavery. Read about traditional slavery in traditional societies. Read about ancient slavery. All of these things will, some often in your subconscious, it will just gestate. Um, I was don't know how to pronounce this word, gestate or gestate, in your mind. You may not always remember the exact thing, but when you come across something interesting in archives, a question can form. So this is, this is basically my advice. There isn't a kind of like a recipe of how do you come across new questions. It is from immense familiarity with both the primary material, the immediate secondary material, and comparative work. Um, I recently, this is the last thing I'll say on this, I recently attended a talk by um, the very famous Charles von Onselen, uh, who, as we know, is one of our great historians. And I was really struck that he said that when he wrote The Life of Kasmain, Kus The City's Mind, that very famous book which won so many prizes, he said that that book was inspired by the literature on 
American slavery, particularly uh, the American South, the United States, not the, the large Atlantic world. Um, and of course, he wasn't writing about somebody who was a slave in the early modern period. He was writing about a 20th century sharecropper. But those ideas could make him think that he got from there, could make him ask questions and think about this case in a different way. Sorry, I went on a bit. <laughs> No, I think that you're also addressing some of the things that I'm seeing come up in the chat, Gerald. Um, and before I get to Stephen, I'm just going to flag that Mark Hackney has said that he remembers using your book, uh, Trials of Slavery and Honors, um, for his honors class and using the court records to find out something about medicine in the Cape, which shows how widely uh, he says you need to cast your net when searching for archival sources. So using exactly. sources in a variety of ways. Um, Prudence uh, would like to know just a moment. Um, I'm just going to take a moment and then Stephen is going to ask the last question and then you can maybe address both of these questions together. Um, in terms of, of, can you give us an example of how you used your linguistics to um, counter some of the representations of these criminal records of slaves in the archives, where there may be some key words or, that came into the record to, to describe emotion or, this, or these responses to physical violence, or um, I guess she's interested more generally in your use of, of, of linguistics to un unpack these kinds of voices. Um, Stephen, would you like to ask your question? And, unless, of course, Gerald wants to answer that first. Um, I think so, because I will forget. I have a very short memories. <laughs> um, just quickly, oh, what am I doing? Um, apologies, I, I click here. Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, Mark, you, you're quite right. One of the fascinating things of the criminal records, there's a PhD in this, is that when people were murdered, uh, you had to do a formal visitation of the body. So you would have a doctor who would go with members from the Council of Justice to inspect the body. And this doctor will write, would write a short report, which ends up being used in the criminal case and thus ends up in the CJ archive. So this, the archive is filled with all of these medical reports, which must, for somebody interested in the history of medicine, must really be intriguing. Um, and, and I also use this example to answer the question about language. I'm not 100% sure that I understand the question, but I can tell you that to translate 18th century medical reports was one of the worst challenges of my life. I had to buy myself, you were going to laugh about this, a couple of medical textbooks on human anatomy in order to understand what they were writing in these documents. Um, because also they would, they would use Latin phrases and they will use technical phrases about describing how a knife went into a body, which organs it pierced. So I had to go and look in my, in my anatomy handbook, what, what exactly are these things in order to translate them? So um, your question about linguistics, it's not like there was something hidden, uh, if I understood that question correctly, that you kind of in, uncover, but you cannot really do this work without an immensely good grasp of the language. One of the things that we discovered, um, uh, there is a, a general assumption among people that if you know Afrikaans well, or if you're a speaker of modern Dutch, you can work with these documents. And actually, when we started this project, we, uh, we hired a, a Dutch speaking person to do the, some of the transcriptions. And when I got them, I see they are wrong. Um, because once you get to work with the material, you know instantly when something cannot be what somebody transcribed. I see this a lot still today when people ask my advice and they send somebody you know who claims to have studied Dutch and they know a bit of modern Dutch and they transcribe and you can just see because they, they cannot read the script and they make assumptions about what it says there on the page whereas if you become familiar and this this is something that is only it's only time and experience that will help you with this when you become familiar with the script with the linguistic conventions you can instantly see what's going on um, you cannot do this work if you have a superficial knowledge of the language. And this is why I'm so worried about the future of this sub, 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 sub field of South African history, because very few people have the patience 
and the ability to pick up this incredibly important skill. Um, yeah, I, I, as I said, I'm not 100% sure I to that question, but that, uh, that I think I, I better stop there. Okay, thanks, Stephen. You can ask the last question. I, I, I know we're over time, but I don't think we mind it so much. This is the last seminar and um, it's, it's just really so fascinating. So, Stephen. Thank you, Gerald. This was fa absolutely fabulous. I've, th I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, my question is, it's not really, a, I think it is a question, but it's more just a kind of prompting. Um, I think one of the things that uh, when we read history, we look for is, 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 is people, we want to feel people, we want to be able to kind of identify with them, and we also want to hear their voices. And that's often the language that we use. And I think you've, one of the things I'm, I'm struck by is how, how careful you are in terms of your, your kind of delineation of the limits of, of, uh, of your, your, the limits on your ability and the historian's abilities to access the past in an unmediated way, and in your case, a quite distant past. And I suppose I, if I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, I suppose if one way of putting this is, you know, what, what do you wish you had more of? I suppose, I suspect the answer is ego documents from people like slaves. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to hear your 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 thoughts about the limits of what we can actually know, especially because of the kind of mediation of sources and because I suppose of the otherness of the past, because it's something yeah. I think a lot of our, especially a, a lot of students look for, is they want to hear slave voices as if they can be heard in a kind of a straightforward way. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Stephen. That's a wonderful question. I appreciate it. Um, I always say to my students, and I, and I tend to go on about this, that history is a concrete discipline. It's a discipline of the specific. It is not a discipline of vague generalization. Then you're not doing history, you're doing something else. Um, and this is something you can see. I'm glad you say that I do this carefully. I am very careful about what you can do. And you will remember that I said in the talk that you cannot, in most cases, hear the voice of slaves directly. It is mediated, it is muffled through so many layers, through what's happening in that instant of you are on a room with very particular power relations going on and you are you are, you know, afraid. Uh, you're afraid of what's going to happen to you in the instant. Era. Then it gets written up by a clerk or somebody who's already making a bunch of assumptions in a language that has changed significantly the past 300 years. Then, you know, 300 years later, I come as a historian with my baggage, with my knowledge um, and assumptions, and I look at this document, and then you can see how many layers there are. But still, if you are patient with some of the examples I've given, you can see how in some cases, occasionally, you can hear something direct. You can hear like this last case of Cupido from Malabar, which so struck me at the time, and there are a few others like this. We can just absolutely see the anguish even through um, all of these layers of mediation, even in this language that's not his own language, you know even if the fact that it's written up by people who are not sympathetic and so on and so forth. So yeah, it is, you have to be careful. You have to get away from assumptions. You have to get away from generalization. You have to, to, to treat each case in its own, as its own particular example. Um, and you have to really know what you're doing in that case. So what do we want more of? You're right, ego documents. So th th what's happened, um, I'm intrigued, nobody asked me about this question about the, the why does the C CA, the C series, the Council of Policy series look so fabulous and the CJ series is falling apart quite literally. Some of those, they were all bound up in the late 19th century. Some of the bindings literally falling apart and the pages are loose. Um, and there's a reason for this. So up till about, the early 1980s, the sub archive of the VOC archive that was privileged was this Council of Policy um, archive. This is the decision, the minutes, the letters, all of the things that the Council of Policy decide, all of their correspondence with the VOC directors and the VOC uh, administration in Batavia and so on. Um, because that is, of course, which until the, the, the idea of history from the bottom up in South Africa came in the 1980s. Up till that point, history was to deal with 
you know, important structures, the government structures. So that is why that archive was treated very carefully. It was rebound beautifully. The pages are put in between silk. It is quite something magnificent. It must have cost a fortune. And then what happens in the 80s, the shift to social history, history from the bottom up, and then suddenly historians realize if we want to write about slaves, we don't have any ego documents from them. We only have these uh, brief references in the, in the Council of Policy archives because, you know, slaves is just one aspect of the economy for them. They don't care, they don't care about them as people. How do you, you get to them as people? You can start looking at court records. And of course, it was pioneered by Nigel Wooden and Robert Ross. And that means that their students, and I'm one of them since the 80s, have been using the CJ records very intensively. And now, of course, there's no money to, to, to take care of them anymore, not really a world desire. And that's why they are not in a good state. So the, 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 those documents have been mined pretty well. I don't see that there is a going to be a major discovery of new qualitative material regarding Cape slavery that we haven't had before. There are some things here and there. Um, so for instance, about 15 years ago or so, um, Susan Newton King, of another famous Cape historian, discovered the whole tranche of letters of former slaves, freed slaves at the Cape, who corresponded with people in, in Colombo, uh, in Ceylon, or what's now Sri Lanka, um, uh, which we didn't know about, but they were hidden. There is the biggest sub archive of the of the VOC archives is the master of the orphan chamber, which is a very complicated business, um, but it has to do with estates, estate papers and inheritance and stuff like that. And when people die, as you know, even today when someone dies, the, the estate papers could be extremely voluminous. And then sometimes very weird things end up there. And because this archive is so vast and not very well organized, there could still be little things like that there. Some letters, uh, little things that we, we didn't know about before. That, that archive has not been properly um, explored yet. But I, 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 the, 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 the crime records have been well done. Trials of Slavery presents a small, small fraction of it, even though you know it's 700 plus pages long. Um, ideally, one would love to transcribe all of it. It could be done relatively cheaply. Um, but yeah, um, it, it, I think I'll end there. <laughs> I, I probably talked too much, sorry. Gerald, I think on that note, we'll, we will end the seminar. And um, I, I think what you've reminded us of are the, the things that make us passionate about history. I mean, issues of power and issues of social history and issues of the human being, you know, that, that we're all looking for in the archive and archives themselves. So I think it's a really um, important note to end the semester on. And I just wanna say thank you so much for stepping up and presenting today. So if, thank if, you, Tembisa, and thanks to, for all the questions. I appreciate them. Okay. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye everyone. Thank you for coming and we'll see you in August for the next uh, Journeys in History seminar. Bye-bye.